Could I ask you to take your seats? And I just want to quickly make some introductions and get some welcomes from some folks here. Uh, for those of you from out of town and uh, from a long way, I really, really appreciate you being here and being here as well on this somewhat chilly morning. Uh, it's only going to get worse. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'd, I'd like to start um, very honored and pleased that our provost, Provost Joseph Harmon, is here today to give a welcome to you to this campus and to this uh, networking discussion and conference we're going to have here. And I'd like to call upon Provost Hartman to come and say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, John. Well, good morning. Probably don't even need that. I like to yell a little bit. Uh, wake you up if the cold didn't do it. Uh, but good morning. And for those of you from uh, outside of the area, welcome to Lowell. It's our pleasure to have you here. Pleasure to host this uh, uh, learning cities in North America conference. You know, as the chief academic officer, I'm, I'm just honored to be able to help you kick this off. And, and, and when John asked me to say hello oh, this morning, you know, I, it was an opportunity for me. I've been here for a little over six years, but really to reflect on the, the true integration of the university with the city and how important that is to this effort moving forward. You know, I think a lot of cities can a lot of urban universities can claim a nice relationship between the city and the university, but it's hard for me to envision a place that has one that's much more integrated than we are. And the reason is we were sort of born at the same time for similar reasons. Uh, for those of you that had the chilly walk over the river this morning, you may have noticed this is where we have that wonderful altitude drop in the river. And because of that significant drop, the increase in the water flow, Someone brilliant out there said, if we built a canal system, we can power what became the birth of the American Industrial Revolution and power those textile mills. And when that happened, what a wonderful thing, right? It opened up a city, and decades later, immigration, we have this wonderful, vibrant, diverse, uh, culturally diverse city. Um, it's also why the university started, right? With those needs came the need to, to uh, provide education in the city, which was the start of Lowell State Normal School in 1894, and also a need to educate the workforce, which became the birth of Lowell Textile School, which eventually became Lowell Technological Institute uh, one year later. And, and so our roots, you could argue, started between the city and, and the university, started in economic development, and, and those continue today. We have a vibrant medical device incubator downtown with over 40 uh, uh, companies in it. We have an innovation hub, which houses a lot more companies right down in the Hamilton Canal District. Uh, we even have our graduates going through our innovation programs like Difference Maker, and, and you may have heard of this cool uh, uh, startup called Invisaware, which makes a, a very elegant safety device, featured on Good Morning America last week, but they're actually making product in the city of Lowell now and distributing from here. But to say it's all about economic development, I think, is kind of a short change is what we do around here. It really is centered on learning. And, and you look, thanks to our, our friends here from the National Park Service, the things that we do together when I think of this uh, Songus Industrial uh, History Center and the education programs that we provide for students across the state, across, from wherever they want to come, the curriculum that, and that, that work between the, that group and our College of Education. We also have the, uh, the archives, right? And, and again, partnering with the National Park and the Center for Lowell History. A wonderful space there down in the Mogan Center. Uh, someone that envisioned us becoming a, a learning city uh, many years ago. Uh, and also, the, that, also that partnership on the oral history, which to capture that wonderful immigrant history that we have. We partner with Project Learn. I don't see LZ here. Yep. Hi, yeah. Yep, you're representing, okay. I, I know she's coming today, but uh, on a lot of STEM initiatives, and to the point where just this past summer, for the first time, we we housed the uh, summer program, STEM summer program for the Lowell Public Schools on our campus. Um, <clears throat> you know, our you teach and service learning courses, where we help. Obviously, our students are being educated on campus, but they go into the community to share their learnings, often in the high schools. You know, I've seen topics, anything from maybe not as exciting, uh, thermodynamics all the way to the effects of climate change and opening students' eyes to this and getting them to think about coming to the university down the road. Even to projects, working on uh, redesigning schools or redesigning walkways and bridges to trying to figure out how we can help with our homeless issue in the local area. Uh, it's easy to think about the arts. There's been a renaissance, obviously, for decades. It's in the city, uh, converting some of these mills into wonderful uh, studios. 
but also that opening of, of our arts and music department at the university to the community for open concerts, to the Strings Project, where we provide uh, music education for K through 12 throughout the, the greater area. We're great partners with Middlesex Community College, one of the biggest uh, community colleges in the entire state. Uh, it's a seamless transition for students there, but we share dorms, we, shall, we share curriculum. I know that we're even having a mixer between faculty tonight down there. I guess that's why they're not all hanging out with you, but with them, <laughs> to, to make sure that that's, it goes deeper than just transfer of students. Um, and we think about, you can't even forget our Mill City Grows partnership, right? Where we're, we're doing urban agriculture throughout the city to teach people about food, but also to put food on our tables. And then I can't, it, probably I'd say the strongest connection comes from our Center for Community Research and uh, Community Engagement, uh, led by Robin Toof. But just looking at her uh, website uh, in, in reflecting on this, they have formal collaborations with, I hate to do lists, but here we go, Boys and Girls Club of City of Lowell, Coalition for a Better Acre, Cultural Organization of Lowell, Lowell Aud Adult Education Center, Lowell Community Health Center, Lowell Division of Planning and Development, Lowell Health Department, Lowell Housing Authority, Lowell National Historical Park, Lowell Police Department, Lowell High School, and Lowell Public Schools. But I think what captures the essence of what we're talking about here today in this learning city it is I plucked right off their website. Here's what their mission is. We believe that the university is a resource to communities. In this regard, we seek to, we seek to maximize relationships between the university and community to ensure equal justice and equal rights including equal access to health and education opportunities. You know, so the, the, the ties between the city and the university are extremely tight, and, and the, universe, or the, the city itself is a learning city. You know, we, we like to say around here there's a lot to like about Lowell, but the fact is there's a lot to like about, and there's a lot to learn in Lowell, and the university is truly thrilled to be a part of it. But thank you, and have an enjoyable and productive day. Well, welcome everybody. You know, the one thing about John is that he said, I have this conference set up, it's going to be informal, don't worry about it. So I said, I don't have to wear a necktie. I come to the conference and with this, John to greet me at the door. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank the provost also for the kind words because it's true. It's all about partnerships. That's what makes Lowell such a great place and the University of Lowell such a great place. But I have some prepared remarks because I think uh, what we're trying to do is very important to this city. So I want to welcome all of you to this first networking conference and workshop and on developing learning cities in North America. Although the U.S. has temporarily suspended membership in UNESCO, our goal in Lowell is to develop the ideas of learning cities as promoted and created by UNESCO Global Networks of Learning Cities. A learning city promotes lifelong learning for all. This is an idea that has deep roots in Lowell. In the 1960s, one of my mentors, Dr. Patrick Hogan, helped to bring the decision makers in Lowell the concept of Lowell as an educative city. In essence, the entire city is a classroom without walls. The idea eventually gave rise to Lowell's National Historic Park and many of our later developments that have shaped our modern city. Now, the city, along with our institutional and organizational partners, have made a commitment to work together to make Lowell a city of learning. In doing so, the city enhances individual empowerment and social inclusion, economic development and cultural prosperity, and sustainable development. Lifelong learners are citizens who acquire new knowledge, skills, and attitudes <coughs> in a wide range of contexts, are better equipped to adapt to change in their environment. Lifelong learning and the learning society therefore have a vital role playing in empowering citizens in effecting the transition to sustainable societies. Our aim is to begin a dialogue between cities in North America and successful model of learning cities elsewhere that share knowledge, experience, and provides guidance and advice on how to create a learning city. And to put this together too, I think it's, it's a lot of words. Sometimes some may say this is gobbledygook. No, this is these are very strong words because it's talking about ensuring that every citizen in our community, from the day they're born, the day they die, are constantly in a learning situation. Because as we become true lifelong learners, 
It just strengthens the city. It just makes Lowell a better place. It makes anywhere a better place. And as a matter of fact, I'm on the board of the Park Election Series. This is, uh, for those who don't know, this was established in 1917. And the mission of the Park Election Series, started in 1917, is exactly the mission of the UNESCO Learning City to create lifelong learners within this, for their citizens. So what we have, what we've been able to offer for, well, you know, well over 75 years, 80 years, is a chance for people to understand about health issue, financial issue, political issue, issues of the day. And so this has been part of Lowell's, uh, we'll say, bringing up. And uh, so I want to welcome all of you that are here today to help kick this off because we have a lot of people that want to see this happen. And as mayor, this, if there's anything I, I would like to leave as a legacy is that Lowell becomes a UNESCO American city, that we have established our cooperation with cities all over the world for one common interest, making sure that we enhance the quality of life of our people. So thank you for being here. John, thank you for setting all of this. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Woodin. Thank you, everyone, and good morning. I'm Cecilia Idikakalu. I'm obviously a woman and a mother of three. It's, those are my lines, sorry. I had to start from there. I came to law on August 24th, um, 2017. As a doctoral student, I was accepted to um, the UMass Law Global Studies PhD program. Not quite sure what to expect when I got in here with three kids because it was like facing a very huge mountain, um, a big shot on funds as a single, single parent, but determined anyhow to move myself and my kids in the direction of my dream. My dream had been to have a PhD before I'm 50. <laughs> as a young girl from Nigeria, not from a particularly wealthy home, it was a very big dream. It was a very big dream I had pursued for some time with gaps and lapses of many years in between as I approached my 40s. But um, after my master's program, I had to spend another seven years and try to get to school where I could get funding and come and uh, do my PhD program. It was tough. I, I had several rejections and eventually I got an acceptance from UMass Law. It was the first time I was hearing of University of Massachusetts Law. When I applied, it was the, the, I had um, a friend that was Saudi Arabian, and she told me about the school. She was here, and we did our masters together. And I said, Faisal, what is it about this school? How did you find yourself there, and why you, you keep talking about it? She insisted I apply, and I did on a whim. And incidentally, it was the only school that that accepted me and gave me full funding to come and pursue my um, doctoral. That's how I got here. That's my backstory. Um, coming from Nigeria, I should mention that with my three girls as a single mom. So like I said earlier, when I um, got here, it was quite tough. Trying to coordinate things, first of all, setting into the community. Um, the International Students Office introduced Gordon Ham to me. He had the African Community Center. I insisted he show up here today because um, I needed to um, have my conversation in context with some of the actors around. I'm forever indebted to them. Anyway, he in a week got, gave me access to you know, documents, places, people, including um, the family resource office. Lowell has one. Um, Lowell has the ACA, the um, Family Advisory Council. Um, I was going to show you the handbook, but for today, probably in the course of the day of tomorrow, I'll show you the handbook they gave me. That was basically my encyclopedia for directions and law for the first month of my being here. So basically, um, light came in. Things got easier suddenly just before classes started. And I was very much amazed at the wealth of resources available in law for families and for people like me. It helped me feel at home right before I started classes. The structure of um, learning in my department, I don't feel it's a far departure from other departments, but I'm telling you sometimes my professors, not Professor Wooden, 
some other professors <laughs> would actually let me bring the kids after school and have them right outside of the classroom and insist where we can watch them while we take classes and when we're done take them home. So um, to a large extent they made it easier for me to go through my program and, and um, raise kids. That's just a bit like insight into how I've been able to pull through as a doctoral student with kids in, in um, law. How does that tie into the city of learning context? I would really much have jumped into examples. I had the list for the things that um, Dr. Hartman talked about that I participated in and my kids too, but I don't have it on my list. So I want to say those quickly before I forget, right? And I'll go to my list. He mentioned the string project for kids. So that's where my kids learn to learn the, to play the violin here in Lowell, an opportunity I, I, I wouldn't have had otherwise because I wouldn't have been able to um, afford the cost outside of the low context. Basically, the story I'm giving you is the story of my life and how it situates in the learning of, um, city of learning con uh, context. It wasn't planned, it wasn't orchestrated. I just found that basically this thing we're talking about, I'm a good example. It reflects all I have enjoyed and how a city should be for people, maybe people like me and you. The, apart from the string project, the IRC, the International Relations Club in my department has given me opportunities to go um, debating on model UN platforms in the UK where I had never been to before I came here and other opportunities like that for my kids and um, my kids have had opportunities to learn about climate change and bird watching, you know, literally by opportunities the historical park has given to us by sending us emails every day. They have those learning opportunities. We have a catalog of them, but I'm giving you instances. So some of them are here and I got to meet them. And you see how that my kids have projects from school and we have the emails from the community, the lower historical park in the community that tells us, oh, we're going bed watching today, and aha, it ties into your bed project for the week. So we go there, and we get our bed project done while going at, um, around the canals in Low and learning the history of Low and watching different bird species, and watching how they've changed over time because of the industri um, industrialization, and you know, things like that. Personally, even growing with the kids in their context, I've been, so much better than my mind. I've learned so much beyond being a global studies um, student. And it's something I'm personally grateful for. Um, in pursuing my doctoral program here at, at UML, I've had the opportunity to attend conferences and present research that to me I find amazing. I've had strong views about issues that have to do with women in Africa and around the world. But here I got a platform. And for me, that's what education does for you. That, that's my, my one quest for education. The fact that it amplifies our voices, the fact that we get a space, we get to speak, even if it starts from a whisper on different platforms, you can understand better, you can know better, and you can speak for yourself better as well as for others. So for me, it's a big deal. And being in a city like Lowe's, is like a dream come true because you have that kind of fora given to you. And I feel like it's not just because I'm a, a doctoral student, my kids say the same because of different opportunities they are given in different parts of the city. Like the, um, people talk about the city groups, we have a lot of community groups, migrant groups, one of which the African Community Center represents. That has also given me an opportunity to give back. My kids participate in events, but we also have summer programs there where I can go in, in the summer and teach children leadership skills, especially at youth risk and um, kids that have, you know, they, their English learning skills are poor and they have English learning classes for them. And it's funny because it's very interactive and engaged. We are all like, um, there's coherence, there's cohesion. So we collaborate with CMAA. CMAA is the Cambodian Mutual Assurance. And my kids go for summer programs there on their STARS program. And um, when they have events, you know, their water festival and things like that, the festivals are another. Why I think a learning city is key for law is for the fact that fundamentally we already have a lot going for us as a city. We just need to 
um, snowball, have a lot more coherence to it and amplify our voice. I learned this year Ibadan in Nigeria that I'm very familiar with and Medellin in Colombia are now learning cities. Um, I've been to Ibadan, I know Ibadan's history. I know Medellin just by reading. I believe that um, no stands a better step if we all go through, you know, go together, amplify our voice via this platform and get ourselves to be enrolled as a learning city. Professor, I'm very grateful. Thank you very much. So good morning, everybody. <coughs> um, it's a really exciting day to be here. Uh, I visited last May during the second Lowell Festival of Learning, and I met some of you folks, and I was really, really inspired uh, by what I heard and what I felt was happening in Lowell. Um, I think what Lowell has been doing and is doing uh, is as good as, uh, or better possibly, than uh, cities right around the world who are working in this way to be learning cities. Um, Lowell has been a learning city. It knows it is, it's in its DNA, and um, the question we asked last May was, what's really relevant now is, how can Lowell be a better learning city? How can it do more and do better? <coughs> uh, today is a really good opportunity to think about that. So um, I'm really conscious, and I want to acknowledge John's efforts to make today happen, and particularly when uh, John had a, uh, a wobble a few <coughs> months ago uh, and said, uh, should we go ahead or not? I strongly, strongly uh, suggested to him, uh, not knowing he was going to get sick, to make it even more of a challenge. Uh, you can be very charming about this, I'll warn you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the term was strong armed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that today was vital. And uh, it's vital for two reasons. As the mayor, uh, Bill Samuel, said in his words, uh, UNESCO is working on this program and the US currently. Uh, isn't part of that. So when we brought this up at uh, the UNESCO headquarters for the learning uh, cities uh, effort in Hamburg, they said, uh, you will have to do this, you can help them, uh, and they can help themselves. So today is about that. I'm delighted to be here to uh, throw some ideas around, uh, tell you some things that we've been doing in CAR, um, tell you some things that haven't worked for us, that we've struggled with. I'll tell you some things that have worked for us. Uh, and what I'd like to do, as John has asked me to do, is to uh, really start a conversation uh, among you all about um, what can we all take away from today. So we all work in different contexts. Um, the people here who are here from Lowell, you're thinking about your own city. You're thinking about um, a vision for the future, and I was really inspired by Pat Morgan's vision for Lowell back in the 70s. Um, that vision is uh, as relevant as any vision I've heard for any city, and I, I share Cecilia's uh, challenge that uh, Lowell needs to amplify its voice, and it is so well placed to do that. Um, so from Lowell you're thinking about what your vision is for the future for your own city. Um, I'm coming from a small city in Ireland, so I'm going to ask a, a very uh, real question. Before, uh, before say last year, before John started to do some work with us, uh, hands up how many of you had heard about Cork? Okay, better than expected. Uh, Cork is small. It's the second city in the Republic of Ireland, and um, for us to find ourselves. Uh, within this learning city world, at the centre of things, uh, was all about us taking the opportunities, as Cecilia, as Bill, as the Provost, and as John said, uh, to use the platform that's there uh, to grow genuinely from within, from within our own city, uh, but to amplify our voice. And uh, I believe, as uh, John has again challenged us all to do, I believe in the power of networking, in that if people can genuinely share real experiences and bring the diversity of their lives um, to bear on questions that are troubling us all as we consider the world as it is today, 
uh, that that's the best chance we have of doing something uh, that's meaningful, to focus our efforts and to help change things for the better. So I'm going to start by just talking a little bit about um, where Cork has come from and where Cork uh, hopes to go to. Uh, but before I do that, I thought maybe it would be important you've been sitting listening for a while and I uh, just um, want this to be a conversation. John wants us to do that and I sh share with him his uh, sense that that's what's important today and that's what's uh, the, the best chance of making the best use of our time. So I'm going to, before I start showing you pictures and telling you things that have been really exciting for us in Cork, I want to ask you from the floor if there's uh, one thing that you would like to take away from today. If there was one thing that you, when you were coming along this morning, uh, wondering about, or traveling from around the States, um, that there was, if there was one thing that you would, would hope to take away from today, uh, what, what might that be? Inspiration. Okay. Well, at least do you want to introduce yourself? Let's kind okay. of get to know each other then as we go as well. Hi, I'm Annalisa Raymer from Cornell uh, University in Ithaca. Six hours away, yes. <laughs> um, and we've been trying to, I was so inspired when I went to Cork for the 2017 uh, conference, the Global, the Global Network of Learning Cities Conference. I was so blown away by how well Cork did everything and then learned that the first one had been in Beijing and the second one had been in Mexico City and then here's little Cork um, hosting this big event. And ever since I encountered that experience, I've just been so um, driven by wanting some of that, you know? And I will tell you a little bit more about our context later, but we're all, we are working across lines and celebrating learning together and so trying to figure out who wants to play with us is kind of where we're at now. Thanks, Elisa. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyone else want to say what's the one thing they'd like to take away? Yeah. Celeste? So, um, Celeste Bernardo, I'm the superintendent of the park. Um, one of the things that I think about and I think a lot of us do is there's so many things going on in the city. And so I would like to better understand how did Cork sort how does Cork sort of capture that learning city's concept and communicate out of a city as a park, <laughs> as a national park began to seep in. Sometimes you hear things and you think, oh yeah, I yeah, know I know what that is. And uh, I began to realize that I was only beginning to understand the power of that idea. And again, thinking of people like Pat Morgan and the people he influenced back then and to put this vision out there. Um, and what a powerful, powerful idea that is to have your city as a classroom without walls, as a, as a national park. Again, it's, I think it's unique. Um, I've looked at a lot of cities around the world and I think Lowell has a unique thing to say. Um, so that's something just to reflect back. Community Center, there are two buildings or two uh, structures that I would like to, uh, my takeaway would be motivation. And so um, I'm using this, uh, the Songa Center and then the city. I know immigrants uh, from Africa that have been here for the past maybe 25 years. They live in the city of Lowe. They've never visited the city hall before. The Songa Center is right here, but they don't have the motivation or the privilege to visit the Songa Center. Why? Is I don't have the answers. And so my hope is that if even people cannot even afford to go to such places, for example, the Songa Center to see uh, ice uh, hockey, uh, how do we build the motivation for them to at least know that this place is exist. I'm trying to get a conversation going, okay? Um, you know, Celeste raised a question here about, you know, th those of you who formula know this, but those of you who are new here, 
there's a, there's a shitload of stuff going on all the time, right? It, but it's largely in silos. And, you know, we've argued that the learning city concept puts a, a frame around this in some way. But it, it's difficult to do that. And I, you know, I want to hear how you did that in Cook, because there's a lot going on in Cook. And please hear from where you come from. And then, you know, Gordon's raising the question here, a fundamental question of inequality. You know, uh, uh, we can talk all we want. You know, as a professor, I can say it's great to have people learning, but we know that access and willingness and motivation after we spent, you know, 20 years in schools crushing creativity and curiosity out of our students and our community, how do we get them to be engaged in this? And what does that mean? I mean, there's money and resources involved here too. And Annalisa is starting something in Ithaca, which is a much smaller town with a big university. Uh, and, you know, how do you get that off the ground when you're competing with the behemoth, which is Cornell, I assume, in the city itself? And I know, because I used to live there, Ithaca is rampant with inequality, too. Um, and, and I'm sure we're all confronting those things. And I remember, you know, Seth and I were at a meeting a couple of weeks ago, and, and she was actually being honest to people. Instead of just saying, Law was a wonderful place, she said, well, we've got some problems. I go, where do you go, gal? You know, we have to think about those. So I want to make sure that we don't pretend this is not, you know, everything is perfect. Because it's really, this is a tough road. Anyway. I'm Mary, and I graduated from this university. Uh, I just have a question about uh, sort of structure of uh, the Burning City. You have a centerpiece festival of lifelong learning that went from 60 events to 600. Uh, Cork, the nickname is the Festival City. That could be Lowell's. Big name. Also, uh, I'm just you know I'm I'm assuming that you know the array of festivals provides you a kind of uh, structure for messaging you know uh, on the Learning City vision throughout the year. You know we have the Low Folk Festival. You have this sort of enormous inflection at the end of July, uh, but then there are other festivals. Uh, all of them you know, can be construed as kind of learning experiences. Uh, do you have a, uh, like an intentional process by which you know, the organizers of Corp Learning City interact with the festival uh, uh, producers? Please take away points because uh, if it's not covered in the various presentations, we need to cover it, we need to come back to it. And uh, everybody in this room may help to find some responses to these takeaway questions or challenges. Or okay, anybody else want to say a takeaway thing? Maria. Yeah. Hi, I'm Maria Lee Wong. Um, I'm from uh, New York. Um, so, what I think is really interesting about New York is a huge city. <laughs> so, our focus has been more on the learning neighborhood. Um, scale. And um, for the past few years, I started going to the UNESCO, um, I started in Mexico City in 2015, I think. Could you speak a little louder? Sure. Um, and I, I'm, I'm the dean of a seminary in Harlem. It's called City Seminary of New York. And we have an arts and place-based approach to theological education. We have an art gallery that's our public space that through the art gallery, this is our way to practice hospitality to our neighborhood. And um, so I guess the question that I bring to a lot of these spaces is, where is the place for conversations around faith and, and spirituality in understanding what does it mean in terms of quality of life? I think there's a lot of economic uh, metrics, but not a whole lot of other metrics as we understand quality of life. And so kind of back to um, John's question about kind of gathering people together and bridging and bringing people to have conversations. <coughs> Um, and kind of trying to bridge these silos of all these things are happening. I rarely, if ever, hear in festivals or anything that the, the church might be a rental space, but there's learning that's happening in religious communities, whatever religion you're from. Um, so where are we leveraging um, those conversations? And people are being formed in a community, and hopefully they're able to, um, I mean, there's a lot of interfaith um, things that are happening. So where, where's the space for that conversation in a learning city? That's my question. Great. Thanks, Maria. Anyone else want to add something else into the, the mix? 
things you'd like to take away, answers to questions, challenges? And if you can answer all those questions, we've done them. <laughs> well, we have done some. A lot of questions. Okay, so what I'm going to suggest is there was a, a little suggestion of a, a, a chance to get a cup of coffee. So if you want to just grab a cup now, and we um, have a look through some of the memories of Cork, just to tell you the things we've done, things we uh, have that have worked for us, things that haven't worked for us. I'm just going to grab a glass of water for myself. So if you just want to take your couple of minutes there to grab a cup or to, to do that and. Um, just to uh, say we start the presentation, two minutes, two, three minutes, is that okay? Okay. The context that we're in, in a highly politically polarized environment, how something like a city of learning could potentially get used in ways to, um, to privilege certain voices over others and certain political perspectives over others in quite controversial and destructive ways. Um, and just any sort of experience that you've had with that in terms of how to mitigate that would be helpful. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> a reflection yep. of some of the troubling things that we are thinking about now that we weren't thinking about so much not so long ago. Yeah. They've become really pressing. Uh, anyone else just wants to say who they are before we start? I don't think I have yet. I'm Shamir Rivera Quintel and I'm from Project Learn. Yeah. Cool. Brilliant. Yes. Yeah. I'm Fred Van I'm from the whole country. Two of the challenges that we're dealing with and they is the number of languages and the number of people in the city that are uh, diverse and kind of in some ways in their own cultural pods in the city. How do we reach them across language barriers and secondly how do we build the structure and the money to, to do that, to put that frame of learning around um, everything. And thirdly, I, I came, my question coming here was, uh, where do I fit in and what can I do? Um, what possibly could the alumni in the University of Lowell, uh, Massachusetts do? Um, so. My name is Tony Sampas. I grew up in Lowell, and I, I uh, found great refuge in the Lowell Public Library during the the dark 70s before the National Park out here. It was a different place. Um, I, I feel like I can visually see the change. You know? uh, it, it, was a, it was a rough place. As Samuel Beckett said, sometimes there were more pricks than kicks. Mm -hmm. But there was a library, and I got interested in uh, history and archives and stories and narratives. So I do a few hours at the public library, the public library, but I also work full time at the university. And I'm interested to know how uh, libraries can play with the group if it's not as an active player with uh, events, but also uh, capturing the stories that are created by uh, the, the group and archive. You know, the libraries have reflected a little bit in a while. The libraries have played a really central role in how we have become more about learning in car. Anyone you know, else that hasn't said? Yep. Yeah. Uh, my name is Olf Muyaka. I'm with the National Park Service. I'm the Community Volunteer Ambassador. Um, Lowell's been home for the last 10 years and uh, I've learned from the city and when the opportunity came to participate in this, I didn't think I could turn that down for myself and for the park, but I enjoy being here and I think every bit of the city is um, what I represent. I was born in the Republic of Congo, so um, I'm new to the city. I mean, I can't say that anymore. I've been here for 10 years, but I, I still think I'm new to the city. I learn every day and I enjoy being part of it. And, uh, this Where Cork has been asked to speak, uh, we always start with the thing that worked the best for us, which is the festival. So around this time last year, John brought Lowell to Cork and uh, we had a festivals forum in Cork. Uh, where some cities from around the world that have taken up the idea of a festival came together just to share experiences uh, and try to learn from each other. And uh, that was when we got a sense of how much Lowell had already done. Um, so the festival in 2019, we just did a short film about it, but it can just give you a sense of uh, how it feels, really, uh, as Paul, who's obviously got a good research approach, rightly says, 60 odd events when we started, quite small and it grew uh, to about 600. And 
it came from a small group, smaller than this actually, who thought we should do this. And we didn't have any money. We didn't know how we were going to do it. Um, and I, for one, thought this idea was crazy. Because <laughs> I thought a festival and learning that they were a bad match. A bit like John was saying, uh, learning is, is a serious subject for a lot of people. And a festival, we have lots of festivals in Cork, as, as Paul said, uh, that the two mightn't go so well together. Um, but the concept was, was quite simple. Every event had to be free, and the city wouldn't fund the event. So if you wanted to have an event in the festival, you're, you're, uh, it was an open call, uh, but you had to find a way to, to do it within your own resources. So it kept it very egalitarian. When the program comes out, it's a, a printed program, no matter whether it's the smallest community group or doing a little knitting circle, or um, a lecture, a free lecture on biotechnology and cutting edge research. Um, I'm sure your events that you had in May this year, and I know you're talking about maybe changing the time of year, uh, but the fact that you have a festival that's established, uh, that was our first step that made uh, this real. Otherwise, it's a concept, making Cork a city of learning, that was the ambition back then. Uh, but that festival did more than anything else to make that concept a reality, and you have a festival now. Um, let me see, can I find this? Here we go. So, um, I'm going to focus a little bit on kind of what we've done over the years, and kind of where we're at now. So Cork, as a, a learning city, started in roughly 2002. So we've been at this quite a while. And our current um, concern really is to look at a lot of the challenges that you brought up in your questions are related directly to challenges the, the world is facing, the globe is facing. So the UN have agreed 17 different goals, sustainable development goals. So imagine who's wearing the, the paint, you'll see the, the idea, the circle. Um, so we've taken that idea in terms of our own identity in Cork as a learning city, that that's what we're trying to do. So whatever uh, we, however we go about, and I'll show you some of the ways we've uh, tried to do that. We'll try this one. Um, so UNESCO, in their uh, work in recent years, have identified that cities are where all the problems are focused on and where all the challenges are, but they're also potentially better placed to solve them than national governments. And that's a really exciting idea. So today's discussion, as it relates to Lowell, as it relates to uh, any city, Cork, uh, Ithaca, Los Angeles, New York, uh, or anywhere in between South Bend, um, that's the potential that's there uh, to use the city as a way of uh, making progress on goals that are um, the highest aspirations of humanity currently. Just to give you a sense a little bit about where we've come, uh, you could say that events that happened over 100 years ago were significant, just like uh, the Provost uh, outlined earlier. Um, our uh, journey didn't start in 2002, but those are just some of the milestones. A significant one um, is the 1980s in Cork. I like um, a lot of the world. There was a, a huge recession and it affected Cork in a, in a really bad way. And at that time, uh, the largest manufacturing industries collapsed. Um, so we've turned that around to combination of luck. Um, we had investment from the pharmaceutical industry, but it was our uh, third level, the two third level institutions in Cork, UCC, Cork Institute of Technology and uh, their connection to the city made the biggest difference. Uh, so we've had a quick look at last year's festival in Saracen 2004. Um, in 2015, and I'm gonna talk a bit about that, uh, the idea of signing a commitment in the city, and Lowell is already well on the way to doing that, between the university, the city council, the other third level, Cork Institute of Technology, and our education board, so the further education, adult education, uh, it has responsibility for some second level, so they're a powerful, powerful player. Those four signed an agreement that they would commit to working together. They weren't asked for any money at the time, just to come back to the money question, uh, but they have, they have come good with money since. Uh, in 2015 also, uh, we joined UNESCO Global Network, and again, Lowell, Lowell leads the way is the kind of thoughts I have for, um, for today's discussion, um, because Lowell have a, an application to join the UNESCO Global Network already lodged and just can't be progressed currently. The fact you've done that already is a huge step forward. Uh, so in 
So in 2015, also in Cork, we launched this idea of a learning neighbourhood, and then in 2017, uh, UNESCO chose us to host the third uh, global conference. So those were kind of steps along the way. But it started out particularly in uh, 2002, and a uh, development plan for the city, and some of the questions that you've raised earlier relate to that. Uh, it set out one of seven goals uh, for the city that it wanted to be seen as a learning city. So it, it was very much about its own identity. Um, I think the phrase was used earlier, uh, that there's a lot to learn in Lowell, and the province mentioned that. That's certainly something I think Lowell can and should consider, making itself identified as a, as a place where learning is at its core. Um, the festival, I've briefly given you a sense of it, uh, it covers learning of all kinds and for people of all ages, all interests and all abilities. And it's not curated in that we don't select, we, it's an open call, anyone can uh, put on a free event. Your question about how do you deal with challenging perspectives, and we'll come back to that because we haven't had to, only on a couple of occasions, had to deal with that, but it's, a, it's becoming a very real concern. Um, we do uh, actively uh, try to encourage participants, but increasingly as the years go by, um, participants come to us. So in 2018, these are some of the memories. The 2019 ones you've seen, uh, I suppose a significant one was our president who visited to see the young people playing uh, a musical performance in the library. And his request from his office was that we didn't do anything special for him, that we go ahead with the plan and he would be in the audience. So it was, it was really inspiring. That, that was how the visit was handled and he mingled with the young people after. Uh, so we had to keep it under wraps as to what was happening. It was families were invited and a small number, an audience of about 50 or 60. Uh, but, you know, we had to invite him many times before that, but that was how he chose to, um, to engage with us. Just, was really, again, one of the high points along the way. Uh, the, the photograph to the right, as you're looking at the screen, is a significant one also in that in the last few years we've really uh, pushed the idea that business and industry are places of learning too. So factories open their doors during that week and bring in groups from the public of all ages and they talk about what the factory does uh, and what you can learn either on the job but increasingly there are new opportunities opening up, often in partnership with education partners, uh, and that world of learning in work is uh, being seen in a, in a more real way. Um, our learning neighbourhoods, I'm going to come back to that, but it, uh, it changed um, the idea that the city uh, was just about the festival. Uh, we selected a couple of na neighbourhoods to start as pilot areas, and we grew it gradually from there. So we're now up to six uh, learning neighborhoods. So that's six districts of the city. Cork is small, as I said. There's probably another six or seven to go. Our boundary is extended, so we can add another five to that. But you know, we're well on the way that most of the city now has uh, local communities who identify themselves as, as learning neighborhoods. And we have a ceremony at the end of the year. So if you've worked on a program, which the local people create, so we don't set any expectations. The expectation is that you form a group locally, um, you work with the willing, whoever turns up with the right people, you create a plan for your area to improve the learning opportunities, uh, but crucially to also celebrate the learning opportunities that are already there. So uh, going back to the idea that there's so much stuff happening, how do you, how do you work with it? Um, yep. I hate to interrupt you. How did you define the neighbourhood? I think you rightly push this idea of this in the name. We have neighborhoods in, in Lowell defined by various categories. And how did you do it? Um, so we looked at the natural identity. So um, there are parts of Cork that identify themselves based on their, their sporting team or their loose parish structure. And one of the early challenges to us was um, there was there's one quite large area and they're often put together. So the places their Irish names, and I see a lot for that. Bally Fihan is one of them, and Toker is the other. Um, so, would we put them together or would we separate them? And the, we asked the local people, you know, you work together in most ways, so will we um, work with yourselves as a group? And they decided, no way, you know, Bally Fihan is Bally Fihan. So, that was the, the neighbourhood. They defined themselves. There was no, there was no geographical uh, boundary, and we used the word neighbourhood very uh, 
carefully because the idea of community is more strong in, in Ireland. Often you'll hear community initiatives, the local community and so on. Uh, but a neighbourhood is where, like the Sesame Street idea, where people live but also where people work and who are the people in your neighbourhood. And it um, opened up the idea that uh, people could get involved in this initiative who taught in the area, who were community workers in the area, who were local community guardi, good local community police, as well as people who lived there. And um, once they had an affinity with the area, and to make their own effort. So uh, at the end of each year, we celebrate what they've done for the year gone by, and we, uh, as a city, give them a flag to identify, you know, welcome to Toker Learning Neighbourhood. So, and the earlier places we chose, with you know, very carefully, were places that had struggled economically. There was a lot of um, disadvantage, a lot of marginalised uh, groupings would have lived there, and from an educational point of view, would have had uh, maybe poor attendance rates, poor completion of second level, and low progression rates to third level. Um, so you could identify that same area as a, an unemployment black spot, or disadvantaged area, or marginalised community, you could call it all those things. Um, so they're now learning neighbourhoods instead. So it's kind of turning it around. Um, but it, you know, I can throw a lot of what we've learned along the way out uh, during the chat. They're hard earned lessons, some of them. Work with the willing is one. So we picked two areas that we knew there's a strong local structure and there's a good chance they'll run with this. We didn't just throw uh, darts at the, at the map. And the first two were crucial once they were successful and were seen, then the neighbours, like those two areas, Ballyfahan and Toker. Ballyfahan were the ones who ran with it. You can be sure the following year, Toker weren't going to be left behind. They wanted to be mm -hmm. in this mix. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, our city is divided in north side, south side. Northside, uh, generally speaking, is the poorer area, um, or uh, what would have been called working class areas, and with the, in the downturn of the 80s, they were areas of very high unemployment. And Southside is generally more affluent, uh, but we always pick one neighbour from the Southside and one from the Northside, and they compete to outdo each other in learning, so I think that's not a bad, mm. bad thing. So that's our, our learning neighbour. So that grew from the same principles as the festival. There was no funding for this government or the local city government weren't putting out grants and you ask people do you want to get involved what would you like to do and then we will support you to do whatever we can and sometimes that involves trying to find the money to do the things but it isn't where we start so that's that um, an important thing i would always put in our story is uh, in 2012 we had a visitor from overseas an australian business people to attend that morning we did it early in the morning, so they were back at their desks or back at their uh, workstations by half nine. Uh, and it was about celebrating things that are already working. Student entrepreneurship is, um, again, I'm sure it's here in Lowell, uh, but we've tried to celebrate it in a stronger way. And an awful lot of the projects that the student entrepreneurs take on are dealing with social problems. So they're tackling some of the, uh, the weekend problems, we'd say societal challenges and so on, and um, I think they deserve as much and more support from all the partners that were entitled to. And then learning factories, I kind of mentioned that already, this visit was to our local hydroelectric dam, which is normally not available to the public, so you can imagine there was huge demand to go along uh, to that visit. And then green and healthy, um, increasingly I suppose there's a sense that there's a need to prioritise these parts of our, our lifestyle and our way of thinking. Um, three practical projects that have made that uh, a bit more real for us are the Green Campus. UCC, um, some of you, you Mass Lowell know this, um, was the first university campus to be awarded a green flag. The initiative is student-led and it came from the students who participated in green schools projects at primary level and at secondary level. Um, and they wanted to transform the, the campus in all its ways. So those are some examples of what they've done. There's the wildflower meadow, uh, a lot of the produce grown on the university farm is now used in the university restaurants. And they're on their fourth uh, green flag this year. And as you can see, they've held events then which have uh, brought people from all, all over the world, including Colombia and the States, um, to just compare notes and get inspiration and go back and and take this on in their own home universities. We have a very nice Twitter feed also. Green Campus? Green Campus? Yes. Yeah. I subscribe. Log on to it, yeah. yeah. No, they, 
they sent the tweets to me. Yeah. It's actually, it's a very nice um, resource for you know UMass Law students. It's really nice. Very nice. Yep. I actually just have one question about a previous slide. It mentioned a program called iWish for the entrepreneurship. Yeah. This is, could you go into a little bit more detail on that? Yeah, but, um, the iWish uh, initiative is directed at women. Okay. And uh, there are a, group, a steering group of uh, women in leadership roles in city council, in industry, and in services in the city. And they have created an event every year for the, in, in our system, there are largely divided as gender. There's uh, schools for young girls and schools for young men, and they're separated. So it's all this, the girls' schools are invited to an event every year where they uh, get a chance to meet other women in STEM careers, so science, technology, engineering, maths, and other parts of industry. There's uh, really speakers. It's just a brilliant, uplifting event. And, uh, it's just, again, starting to change things. Uh, that ambitions have changed. And, to set limits. So our latest Chamber of Commerce president is a, a woman, only the second in the history since uh, 1819. So again, it's about really projecting that there are no limits. It's down to ability and, and, uh, and willingness and hard work. But again, it's supposed to have mentors. And if you, what's the saying? If you can't see it, you can't be it. Uh, the young women who, who speak at that event uh, just have that whole idea drive right back. Okay. Do you have anything like that in law? Around women involved? Um, we have the Men and Women in Business. Um, okay. It's an organization that they bring in speakers and it's, it's um, so I'm actually a member of the group. It's not exclusive to women, but it's to empower women and, uh, to pursue business. We also have a club called um, Women in Engineering, um, which is a similar yeah. program, but uh, geared with engineering students. Excellent. Yeah, we also have a part of the different things. Different speaker projects here at the university, which encourages students and uh, the community to innovate with ideas, and they get a small prize for the most you know potentially great idea for yeah. rigid development, whatever it may be. They're working on small, but it's uh, again an attempt to think about entrepreneurship and innovation, especially social entrepreneurship or social innovation, whatever that is. Um, you know, thinking about that way. And I, I just want to mention that tomorrow morning. After we're going to visit the, the National Park the, the Museum, we're going to be to, going to the Greenhouse, which is a partnership with the City Crows. Taylor will do about the, the version of this, and show the version of what you've been doing here too. So it's, it's, it's about health, it's about sustainability. I suppose one of the, the questions came up earlier about all the things that are happening, how do you wrap it together, how do you amplify it? I think this is a uh, challenge. Uh, the festival for us in the, in the past, was a good opportunity to wrap something around it and give it a voice and give it a face. So if you're doing uh, Men and Women in Business, for example, if you hold an event during the festival, even if it's a small event, you're now on the, in the book, the, and you can see the book going around with that film, that's become, uh, it's become a thing in Cork, this, this yellow book every, every spring. Uh, and, but that's slightly old technology now, and, and Paul and I were just uh, uh, chatting about that earlier. So social media have become um, much more important in terms of getting uh, sustained messages out about all the good things that are happening on our, our uh, Twitter feed and our Facebook page and our that website. Question, how is the, the branding, how does that work? Do, do we make our own logo or low branding that gets attached to a group that is? Yeah. But uh, the way we've managed that is every uh, participant has their own identity. We don't interfere with their own identity. Even in the program, um, it's reflected. So when the listing comes in, it's the logo of the host organization gets put on it. So the, the wraparound is the event. The same with the learning breakfast. Every company had its own logo up on the big screen. You're welcome to the learning breakfast, Dupuis, Jensen, um, you know, all the, all the participants were there. So we just wrapped it around. It's organized by. Uh, I think it's really important. Same with the neighbourhoods. The neighbourhoods' um, identities are crucial to them, so we had to reflect that in the way we were acknowledging them. Rather than saying this is part of uh, Cork Learning City. You know. There is a logo now, John. You might yes. like to, it's on your table, I think. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, who's um, 
whose brain child is that? Is there a, is there a way to, to think about using that in a more strategic way? We try to do that, and we try to get um, organizations in law doing learning events, festivals, and so forth to use a logo and say, this is part of being the city of learning. You know, I'm not good at this, but this is a branding exercise. This is saying, this logo represents what we're trying to do collectively, to sort of build the you know, better across those silos. You know? And it's a relatively cheap and easy way to do that. And if I was a branding expert, I would do more cool things, but we've got folks who have really thought about that. Like, like, the, like the logo, you know, there's a, Lowell there's a lot to like, and I said to the city council, it's really cheap to put an apostrophe in and learn after that, you know, we have to change it, we have to get a consultant in, it's been a million dollars, you know, and that's another way of branding it. And you yourself came up with Lowell loves to learn, yep. bumper sticker, you know. Yep. And, um, these are pretty cheap and easy ways to say, this is what we do in law. I mean, I know that with other relevant to other folks, but I think it is certainly yep. part of, you know, sadly, but also wonderfully part of doing that. I suppose the, the way, there's a couple of things just about the festival that I might just, well, they come up for me now. One is the Paul's question about leveraging the other festivals. And uh, that's an imperfect science, but the way we've tried to do it is that the learning festival has a presence in their festival, and their festival has a presence in ours. So if the folk festival um, holds an event during the week of our learning festival, it's just one event, but it means the folk festival is represented over the course of that week. And then, when they ask in September for us to do something for them, if it's to provide a, a workshop on traditional fiddle playing, you know that's our piece that we can do to them. So it, it has that's been our our best way to, and I, like I suppose the, the simple thing about it is those of us that are involved in the organising of these things and doing the work behind the scenes, um, some of those events are actually the most fun for us to do. And if you're getting something out of it yourself, that keeps you about motivation. So last year uh, for the folk festival. I was, because uh, I had to ask all the favours, but I was in a boat, run up the river in Cork with fiddle players down the back of the boat, and it was one of the best mornings I've had in a long time. And, uh, you know, it was just, I was doing the favours for their festival, I was calling in the favours that I had available. Uh, so that, that's kind of the way we've done. Who is we? So when you're saying we would be at their festival, yeah. and they would be at our festival, yeah. who is the we? within the, the Cork City of Learning? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, I might send down a list of the, the we, the full list, if you want. But in, um, I think the provost this morning named the partnerships that are available. Uh, so in our case, it's always partnerships, always collaboration. Uh, so sometimes it's me. I'm the face of the we. But the we is, is quite large. So our steering group is uh, so large, you've got a very big steering wheel to, to turn it. But so it's that really collaboration? Yeah, okay. yeah. So we have about, I think, 30 members on the steering group. They don't always come to the steering uh, group meetings. And then we have the advisory group who are the MOU partners who meet maybe twice, three times a year, only as significant decisions. So the wee bit would come from among that group. Sometimes it is just me, sometimes it's me and the chair, other times it's a group of us. Yeah. But it's, it's always we. And uh, if, like today I'm here, but if uh, just another occasion, it could just as easily be a Willie McCall of the chair, or one of the lead partners would send the speaker on behalf of Cork. So our lead partners have spoken in Shanghai, in Egypt, different people. Um, you know, so that's, that's how we've tried to keep it going. Um, just a couple of examples, um, just to throw there. The food forest is the idea that you can uh, replant a car park corner of a car park with food that's edible. And the learning neighborhood was tied into this. It was launched during the festival, so we tried to add value in everything we do. And um, that's just, again, it's, uh, it's minded by the local people who live in that part of the city, uh, and it needs replenishing. Uh, but that's a new type of community uh, engagement. And it's younger adults in the city who weren't that involved in other initiatives we found are, are very motivated with these projects. The other example of the Green and Healthy initiative is called the Playful Paradigm. Bit of Some examples that are really good. One is um, people speaking about their own learning. 
from their own experiences and short piece of video for that or radio interviews yes. oh, yeah. uh, actually were really really important really yeah we are trying to do some kind of shows like we just started our learning city talk show i've just finished my first interview with john Wooding and mr mayor uh -huh. Yeah, so now every, like this one I'm going to edit with your interview, I'm going to make another one. Yeah. So put it on the community TV, local TV, yeah. anywhere, push it out and also on social media. Yeah. Okay, so my question for you is, why learning city, why learning is important? Learning is, is it's like breathing, it's such a part of life. When you're born, you're learning all the time and as you go through your life, learning can become associated with hard work and duty and effort and uh, that's part of learning but it's certainly not the whole thing. So we try and say that learning is for living and it's for celebrating. In Cork we've taken the idea of celebrating learning by having a festival of learning and that celebrates all the learning of all kinds and for people of all ages, of all interests and all abilities. And we found it's a wonderful way to connect people together. If people are laughing, when they're learning, then the learning is all the more powerful. Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to move a little bit. I'm still getting some more shadows on your face. Yeah, that's much better. Is it part of the step one? Yeah. One more step then. Yep. Yeah, I'm just getting so much shadows on you. Please. Do you mind if I have you stand here? Because there would yep. be white walls so I can get some kind of light reflects on. Let's see. I'm in your hands, you can tell me. Thank <laughs> you so much. No, this is much better. This is much better because light plays so many different ways. I cannot control outside light. Generally, I will always carry my gear, but events like this is very hard to. Yeah. Yeah. I think what you do is amazing because those of us who can't get the picture we want, or yes, you I know, mean, try and yeah. do a video, and you just think that's just not yeah. that's not what I was at. It just doesn't even do justice yes. so when you can do it. Because so I'm gonna chop. Because the idea is to whatever you're teaching, whatever you're sharing, people yeah. need to hear, people need to know, yeah. and this is like archiving, like you know, this is precious. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this. I it think. is. Yeah. Okay, so tell me, why City of Learning, why you think Lowell should be a City of Learning? Um, I don't think Lowell should be a City of Learning. I think Lowell is a City of Learning, it has been. Uh, it's in its DNA. Um, when I heard stories about um, influential people, including the current mayor, uh, Bill Samras, and um, Pat Mogan in the 70s, and how he saw the classroom without walls, and the city itself was a classroom. Those are such powerful ideas for any city. So Lowell, I think, has a sense of its own identity as a, a place of learning, and it's a fantastic platform then for it to do more and do better. Um, the partners I know that have been involved are motivated, and uh, UNESCO have a framework that the city can look to uh, as inspiration and for direction. But I think what I've seen means law just needs to keep doing what it has been doing uh, and do more of it. I think uh, from our point of view, uh, from Cork, the other side of the Atlantic, we're really, really delighted to get to know Lowell better. I think what Lowell has been doing as a national park is a unique uh, learning uh, environment. So it's a unique story and it needs to be told all around the world. And we're happy to partner with Lowell today. We're signing a memorandum of understanding between our cities we will continue to work together and I'm really excited to learn more from Lowell itself. Any suggestions for Lowellians to make this city of learning better or more successful? Um, in Cork what we have found works well is where you open up the opportunities to get involved. Um, our festival for example uh, offers any group of any size the chance to host a learning event. The learning event can be as simple as a workshop, it can be a guided walk, it can be a lecture, it could be a dance, a concert, a film. Everything has a learning element once you look for it. So the openness, I think, is one thing I would encourage uh, Lowell, its partners, uh, to take that approach. Um, secondly, 
our idea in Cork that has worked really well is to focus on communities in the city. So the idea of a learning neighbourhood. So where you live and your neighbours around you, uh, if you work together as a team, how can you celebrate all the learning that's happening there now and how can you find new ways to increase the learning opportunities and to do that as a group uh, in a part of the city and that that can grow over time. So in Cork we had two initially and now there are six. I think Lowell could well take the same idea and maybe do it much, much better. Um, so I think Lowell has its own uh, ideas also and I'm keen to hear more about where Lowell takes it. And uh, I'm so happy to be uh, in a better understanding of what's happening here and I'm curious to see where Lowell goes next.